So again, Chris Nichols, um, financial advisor, and really the focus today was about some of the uh, sort of the, our philosophy and some of the uh, protection focused financial planning uh, approach that we take. Uh, this is a you know snapshot of the agenda. We're just going to talk about sort of our philosophy, asking the right questions when you're, you're talking to somebody about really some of their protection uh, uh, focused, uh, you know, where they want to go with uh, their planning. And really, uh, com you know, three areas when I talk about financial planning and protection strategies really tie in with life insurance, disability, and long-term care. A little redundant here, we'll show it again, but obviously everybody knows there's just a ton of, it's a ton of insurance products out there you can take advantage of, and, and Dennis, you probably have <laughs> a, ch a chock full yourself, um, pet insurance, health insurance, but these, these uh, products here can really help in terms of the, um, so helping somebody solidify their future, and we are coordinating certainly their income the assets, as Candido commented, uh, you know, really goals. Uh, so it, it really has an overlap there with a lot of their own uh, personal things. So we're gonna talk about those products and some different strategies within them. But, you know, we always talk about this and team this, you know, what we're trying to work with a client on and, and understanding where they're at in life. There are four guarantees that we kind of embrace. That is that life will change. Hopefully you are on the good side of that change, but you know, inevitably something will potentially happen to either family or your own job situation. So we always want to, uh, people to understand that and to really help them be proactive in their planning. Tax laws will change, right? We may see that later this year, but we've seen the slew of it the last uh, few years and even go back 20 years, there've been a lot of tax law changes. Some of them, you know, straight tax code and others are a little more uh, or not tax code, but tax brackets, but some of them are IRS tax code that are a little, little less transparent to the public. But certainly we will pay taxes and we also are not immortal. Uh, so again, it really ties in with planning and where people want to try to, uh, to, to uh, what, the, what they want to achieve. But the first question we always ask people when we engage in that conversation about insurance and protection and different things is really, what is the purpose of insurance you're seeking? And it's interesting, that really sounds like the most basic, like duh kind of questions, but when you ask that and you really let them talk, they'll, they'll really explain different things to you. You'll, a, you'll kind of know their knowledge of certainly the, we'll talk about life insurance, maybe a little more so right now, about that space and what they're trying to accomplish with it. But oftentimes you can help them and you may see additional needs that, that will lead to more questions. So, uh, you know, the point here is obviously, you, you've heard that saying about assuming, right? We just don't want to assume, certainly, that they have uh, our knowledge of it and that they're making the right decision. So there is a level of, of certainly education and information there. Some of the basic, you know, purposes for life insurance, mainly would be death benefit, death benefit coverage. That would be something that, of course, everybody, I think, associates with the life insurance. Others I talk to say, you know, legacy planning for my, for my grandchildren or children. That they really want to have something uh, when they leave this earth that they can pass along. Uh, when we get into the permanent policy, certainly there's something called cash value buildup. And that's, uh, that becomes a, a tax-free bucket of income. And so, again, there's very different strategies. But going back to the first one, which, of course, is the death benefit protection, the idea there being really helping to protect your assets and income in the household. If God forbid anything were to happen to a major breadwinner that the house, the family, or the business can continue on maintaining the continuity and continue to uh, continue. That's a little redundant, continue to continue. But you, you understand what I'm trying to, uh, to get at there, that it really uh, maintains the, um, the lifestyle. There are two different, when we talk about life insurance, really two different types of life insurance. I won't go into too much in details, but there's term and permanent. And these are the, really the two categories people are aware of. Term is really the death benefit protection, that if anything were to happen, God forbid, uh, to the business owner, to the, to the breadwinner in a household, that, that that would be able to continue. Typically, these go up to 20 years. Some companies are writing them out to 30 years. Um, there is no cash value buildup. On the other side, you have the permanent insurance that is not going to go away as long as you know, premiums are being paid, the cash value, although people can borrow against or take withdrawals against it is not rated too much because that does affect the longevity of the policy. But the idea there is that if you're just, uh, let's say in your 30s, a young family, uh, maybe starting a new business and you get that 
20 year term policy because you need to protect yourself the next 20 years. I would tell you, I'm talking to people, probably Candido too, and the other gentleman, is John. Um, we're talking to people in their 50s that still have that need for life insurance. And so uh, that is a case. Now, the, the, the purpose and the need has changed, you know, in that 20 years. But where are that in their 50s in terms of being able to get it? Um, and is that still something that they can do? Fortunately, hopefully they can, but sometimes they can't. Sometimes an accident or an illness has made them uninsurable. And so there's different planning techniques we, we uh, would call on there. When you get into that permanent world of life insurance, pretty much probably people know whole life, right? But there's another universe there called universal life. And the different carriers may have different types of products, but there's a basic UL, an index universal life tied to the S&P 500 or, or other market index indices. And then there's variable, variable universal life. You see on the spectrum there on the bottom, the risk tolerance goes from the most conservative in the whole life out to the variable universal life, that operates a lot like a 401k where you have the investment options like a 401k, like mutual funds that are within that kind of wrapper and you can actually grow. There's a little market upside. So younger folks, people have higher cash flows and have uh, maybe they've maxed out the IRA or 401k contributions, that could be a viable option as well as assuming the need for life insurance is there. Um, but but I won't bog down too much with that, but you know there are a lot of things sort of under the surface there with the, um, you know, with the life insurance options. It is an evolving industry from the perspective that over the last maybe five to seven years, most of the major players uh, uh, issuing life insurance have made a linked benefit or hybrid policy where somebody who has the life insurance can also get a long-term care benefit out of it. It's not a long-term care policy, but it, it has features that they can accelerate the death benefit early to help cover expenses associated with a long-term or a chronic illness. That's become uh, a very, I think, uh, a popular conversation or, or uh, yeah, I guess popular, yeah, with people in their 50s and 60s that are looking now at the next stage of their lives into retirement and asking those questions, especially if they had somebody they took care of. I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, but uh, that is something that legacy policies maybe going back 10 years or more that are permanent do not have that long-term care component tied to them. They just weren't underwritten at the time. Life insurance companies said, hey, we're paying this death benefit anyway. Why don't we allow the people to take it early? Uh, but again, that's contractual. They're also evolving with uh, the digital world and especially in this time of the pandemic and COVID that many of them have the, the digital application as well as e-signature. So it's a case of maybe having the Zoom or conference calls with people, but they can apply online and they can do the e-signature for the application and the policy. So the companies that were a little more proactive in delivering that have actually had a leg up during this time where nobody's really been able to, to get together with paper apps. Um, and also can be much faster than a paper application. They've also innovated in going to fluidless underwriting. It's very costly to be doing the whole review, the medical, the blood, urine, what have you, to really see someone's health. And they're relying on something called the Medical Information Bureau. And that is basically a repository of all of our medical information, right, through the hospitals and our doctors, as well as their interview and application, as well as the attending physician statement and basically, you know, how their health is. If they're healthy, uh, rather than wait and go through all these steps and just the, the signs or the, the, the public data or I should say the MIB data show they're healthy, a lot of times they're just gonna issue the policy. So that's been very helpful as well in terms of, of getting people being able to get the coverage. So we talk about life insurance. There are a couple of different strategies I just wanna just want to touch on um, because it is it can go beyond certainly just the death benefit, right? It can really go beyond that with the planning. So let's talk about IRA wealth transfer and this is just a concept, again, it's, you know, it's a situation where somebody is uh, in their 60s or their 70s, they're rolling up into uh, having to take their required minimum distributions in their early 70s. Many people have really done well socking, you know, their, their uh, IRA monies away or 401k monies qualified. And now they need to take those monies. They have, let's also assume they have a family, they have children and grandchildren. They don't really need to take those RMBs, but the government is saying, you put this away tax-free for 40 years, 20 years, 
Uncle Sam wants wants the uh, you know the monies that, on the taxes. So they're required to take some monies out. What we would say is, hey, let's let's you leverage that money, open up a policy for your children, right? Where you're the owner, the children can you know certainly benefit because they now have death benefit protection on their children, so the grandchildren, but generation one is the owner of the policy. And if they would need that cash value, let's say in their 80s or 90s, because they have a, a long-term care scenario pop up, they have access to that monies or other. So that's just a concept. Again, another one is called pension maximization. This would be more for those people looking at taking a pension, police, fire, teachers. Uh, you know, typically when they take a pension, there's five or, or so areas to take the payout, right, which is their pension. The top one does not have uh, life insurance or any kind of death benefit coverage. So they have to scale down, take less of a benefit to create that. And we might say, it depends on their situation. We might say, you know what, take the highest and then take out a life insurance policy. The other thing is if they do take that benefit, right? Uh, or that second or third payout that gets a death benefit to their spouse, typically and they were to pass, there is no death benefit for the children, uh, typically. So we wanna help them, again, solidify their future. Some of this is estate planning, but also is legacy. And, and a lot of times they don't, you know, they just don't know these things. Uh, and that's our role as the advisor. Small business purposes for life insurance may be funding that buy-sell agreement. This really speaks to helping the continuity of the business, two, three, four business owners. And they need to, uh, if they have a, you know, basically a, a buy-sell agreement, how are they gonna fund it if God forbid one of them were to pass? And then you have a little more established companies, something called uh, key employee planning. That is a strategy of rewarding and retaining key employees. And that's also working with, with life insurance. Those are some of the, uh, the main things I just wanted to hit with life insurance. Um, yeah, Dennis, yeah. It's Paul. Uh, just a or quick Paul, question so. on the last slide. Um, yeah. Can you go back to the last point you had about the using life insurance to retain key employees? Is that right? the benefit as an incentive or just using a policy and saying, if you stay, we'll liquidate part of a life insurance policy to pay you? Yeah. So it's a little bit of both. You, I don't know if you've heard of ERISA. So that would be the, you know, effectively 401k plans. They're, they are uh, ERISA plans that fall under the, you know, the IRS code. There's also non-ERISA that we can utilize. Uh, that would be a permanent policy building up cash value. And there's a variety of different ones where the employer can do the funding in the vehicle, uh, the employee can do the funding, or it can be shared. Okay. And then, and that becomes part of the, um, the benefit to the employee with that employer. And then if, again, it, it could be a key employee thing where if the employee passes, that is the owner, uh, the owned by the business, or it can go to the, uh, the, the, fa the remaining family members. Right. But, but as you're building, as those contributions are made, it could be a deferred compensation arrangement. As the cash value is building, that is also going to supplement uh, retirement with a tax-free income benefit. And so, yeah, I, I, that's a great question. I kind of left it broad because there are about four or five strategies within that, depending on the, uh, how the employer wants to you know, construct the, uh, the benefit. So right. the idea that if the employee leaves, they no longer have access to those funds? That would depend. They, they could actually, you know, take the policy with them. It would depend on the, what kind of a policy they would have set up with the employer, you know? Um, that was, yeah. What's the difference uh, between this and key, what's key man insurance? Yeah, great question. So key man insurance is basically a small employer saying, if I have a, let's just say the chief marketing officer of the company, maybe there's five officers, right? And the chief marketing officer, it may take a year to, to really replace that individual. So they take out a, the company takes out a policy on that key employee that if God forbid they were to pass, they would actually receive now, you know, the, 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 life, or the life insurance proceeds, but that'll help them bridge over. They can bring on a temporary while they're doing their search. So they're yeah. really not under the gun to go out and get somebody who really could be that rainmaker, pivotal uh, role in the organization that they have still the funding through the life insurance to to mm. come up with any shortfalls in revenue. Yeah. Now, does, does the employee have to know that you're taking out key, key, key man insurance on them? That's a great question. Um, they probably would. Uh, I, I, I'd have to come back to you on that, on that answer uh, because the, uh, the people are underwritten. 
for the unless, unless somebody else knows the answer to that but, on the call. I was going to say, Chris, for the underwriting purposes, they would they would definitely need to know because um, they're yeah. going to sign off on the medical side. Yeah, yeah. I fi yeah. I figured that <laughs> they would have to like you know, you guys about to croak. Yeah. You can't uh, you guess, sign them up for a second. It gets a little crazy because the the employer, of course, is the owner of the policy, right? Yeah. And so yeah, and so the yeah, but um, but good, great question. I'm going to take out a secret life insurance policy on you, Jonas. Don't do that. <laughs> Any other questions before I continue on? Thank you. All right, disability insurance. This is a kind of a little misunderstood uh, insurance policy out there, but effectively, because you know, people get in an accident, they get injured, they 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 go to the hospital, they have the the health care is taking care of their bills there. Um, can they return to work? If they cannot, and they, you know, and they have a policy, something called disability insurance will now replace that income. Um, and I, you know, a lot of employers might offer a, a third or you know up to uh, sixty percent of disability coverage. That's great. Sometimes the quality of the pol of the policies are not that strong, uh, but there is these are very highly customizable policies. So if somebody wants to replace 1,000 of income or up to 10,000 of income, you know, that's kind of their, uh, their option. Of course, they have, to, they have to prove income to back that up. The underwriting is similar to life insurance where there is a health and medical review. And a lot of times, you know, I'm working with somebody right now who has a, is a pharmacist, has had some, you know, physical issues, but also a little anxiety. So, you know what, the company's basically saying, okay, we're going to have some exclusions on those conditions right, that if you needed, if you had a disability based on those, it's effectively pre-existing, but they're still covered for so many other ailments or potential accidents. Um, but in selecting the, you know, the policy or designing it, the policyholder really identifies the monthly benefit amount, the duration, is it gonna go for two years, five years, up to age 67, and then the, there's a variety of riders that could really help enhance the protection. The other, uh, area of protection I've commented on would be long-term care insurance. And this is really, I think our country right now is at a crossroads. And Dennis, I don't know if you're dealing much with this or the other advisors on the call, but it's very, it's very challenging. You know, the long-term care policies originally were written 20, let's say 30 years ago, but the carriers probably had no idea of where we would be at with longevity and cost of care today. So, you know, many people have a long-term care policy. The premiums can go up. And they have been going up, you know, and some of the carriers have gotten out of that business. The problem is that somebody can sink in 50,000 or more into a long-term care policy. It can have great benefit, great coverage, but if they don't need it, if they die of something else, that's a basically 50,000 that really was an expense that they were not able to take advantage of. I mentioned earlier the lot the life insurance now is, is basically being written to have some coverage through of, of long-term care expenses and that's a path that a lot of people are going uh, if they don't need the long-term care then their family or other people or you know charities will get the benefit of the proceeds but you can see here from genworth study the national median costs of health care and it really stair steps up mindful that a married couple has a spouse to take care of the other person now that's not maybe their forte, <laughs> I'll be straight, you know, and somebody don't want to, maybe they don't want to be in that role, but you can see, so in that case, you might have a home health aide come in periodically. It doesn't have to be, you know, full-time, but uh, periodically visit the home, but there's adult daycare, and then you get into assisted oh. living over 40, or over 4,000 a month, and then nursing home, uh, a semi-private and a private room. And this, you know, so having the long-term care policy or something in place to cover these costs is really estate preservation. Um, if you don't have a policy or anything to cover it, it's really self-insuring and that can really hurt the estate if they wanted to, you know, pass things on to children uh, or to others. I'll pause there, Dennis. That was the uh, extent of my, my uh, song and dance today, but I'll also pause for questions. <laughs>